Could old U.S. policies be fueling the current influx of undocumented immigrants from Central America? D.C. Breakdown gets a new perspective on this issue. I'm Angela Ray. Let's get started. Breaking through the rhetoric, breaking down the issues from the nation's capital, this is D.C. Breakdown. Immigration continues to be both a political and a very emotional issue in this country. D.C. Breakdown has reported extensively on the topic. Tonight, a different perspective on why so many continue to enter this country illegally from Central America. We're joined by Ritu Sharma, Executive Director of Women Thrive. Ritu, always good to have you here. Good to see you. Love your book. Um, Want to talk about what's going on with women and girls in Central America, which I know some of your book, you had actually spent some time with the women in Central America. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and what it has to do with the, the immigration that we're seeing in this country. Well, a lot of women and girls have their backs up against the wall <clears throat> in Central America. I went to Honduras and Nicaragua in particular, and the violence there is just so endemic from gangs, uh, drug violence, to violence in the home, violence in the schools. So that's a big reason that girls and women are leaving. But there's a bigger story than that. You know, underneath that violence mm -hmm. are a lot of economic problems that I think are not getting the attention that they need. Okay, let, let, before we get to, because that's a huge issue, before we get there, Tell me, women and girls are disproportionately impacted by the violence that is, is being seen in Central America. Oh, no question. Uh, it's not to say that men and boys are not impacted, too. There's a lot of gang violence that affects men and boys. But women also have that gender-based sexual violence, partner violence, domestic violence that they face that is particularly pernicious. There are some countries in Central America where the rates of violence against women and girls are 75% or more. Oh my God. It's unbelievable. And, you know, given that, you know, the choice of a mother to send her daughter north or have her stay at home where she knows, she knows that daughter's going to be raped again. Oh you know, what kind of choice is that? when you think about those mothers. I, I would hate to face oh that kind goodness. of choice. And you are a woman of the world. You have traveled all over. You've spoken with women all over the world. I, is this one of the more disgusting, stickier portions of the world that you've seen with respect to women and, 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 and girls and the way they are treated? Or, or have you seen also pernicious, awful situations in other parts of the world? It's so hard to talk about it, too. <laughs> Well, I, I wish I could tell you that this was sort of an isolated region, mm -hmm. but, you know, the machismo that you see in Central America, you see in the Middle East, mm -hmm. you see it in South Asia, you see it in the Pacific. In Papua New Guinea, there's a 98% rate of sexual violence in the home. What? So this is an issue that we have to start talking about it more around the world. We've kind of taken it on mm -hmm. in the U.S. a little mm -hmm. bit. But around the world, it has really been taboo until very recently. All right, let's get back to Central America and, and the immigration issues here in this country. Um, you know, obviously, we've seen a lot of, of immigrants coming from Central America this year, 2014. Um, and yes, we understood that there was violence. I don't think we understood the extent of the violence to the girls. And you said something that mothers are having to make the choice whether to send their girls away, not knowing what will happen to them as they leave that country to come to the United States. Hopefully, the mothers are hoping that they can stay, but that's the mother's option or let their child stay there and potentially, almost for certain, be the victim of violence, Absolutely. sexual violence. Yeah, it's not a good choice, and I think that a couple of things are compounding the problem. And one of them is sort of the endemic poverty that we have seen in Central America historically, and even in the last 10 years, some of that poverty has gotten worse, in part because of actions that the U.S. government has taken. 
and I think we need to sort of have a bigger picture of what's really going on here. You know, it's it's related. Everything's connected. Yes. So what we do in the United States is very connected to what happens in Central America. And as we're seeing with immigrants coming here, what happens there yes. is connected That's to, right. to us. So, so tell me, what has the United States done to sort of force this to happen, all of this immigration that we're seeing? Because I feel like there's a part of the puzzle that we're not hearing. There's a piece of the puzzle you're not hearing much about, and that is the Central American Free Trade Agreement, which the U.S. signed with Central American countries in 2003, 2004. The Dominican Republic joined that a little bit later. And that trade agreement basically said these countries are going to open their borders and let in U.S. agricultural products, corn, beans, wheat, rice, pork products, chicken products, etc. So the Central American economy became very open to U.S. exports. And part of the problem was that that was people's livelihoods. You know, the small farmers out in the fields in the rural areas, these poor families, they were growing rice and corn and beans to feed themselves, but also for their income. And, you know, the prices weren't good for there. I mean, they were selling some pretty expensive stuff because they were growing it in small amounts. So when this rice and wheat came from the United States and kind of flooded their market, these poor rural farmers couldn't sell their goods anymore. So stop. When the United States was a part of the, the Central American, this free trade agreement, did we not take into consideration that, that this was going to negatively impact the farmers there, small, small farmers, who, like you said, are not only, you know, growing the food so that they can eat it, but this is all they have to sell? You know, we sort of did. We put a safeguard in the trade agreement that said, you know, for foodstuffs that are really important to people's livelihoods and health, the, the government of that country, Guatemala, Honduras, Nicaragua, they could put a safeguard on that product and say, we're not going to open our markets to, say, beans immediately. We're going to phase that in over three or four years. And, and that sounds reasonable. It's a good thing. But if you're a farmer that's been growing beans for generations, Four years is not a lot of time That's right. to kind of revamp your farm right. and start growing, you know, onions or cantaloupes or right. flowers. They don't have the know. money to revamp their farms. That takes a lot of money. Exactly. They just don't have the capital to do that. So what has happened, even though there were safeguards on the products, those have long been passed now. It's been 10 years since the agreement, more than oh. 10 years since the agreement's been in effect. And now we're starting to see the results of that. You know, Big farms have moved into Central America, Dole Pineapple, you know, the big guys can move in, That's right. put in the capital, you know, and, and have access to that U.S. market, right. but the small farmers can't do it. And the small farmers have families. Those exactly. families consist of children. They then have to concern themselves with, I can't feed my family. Exactly. What's my next move? Now we're looking at another reason for the influx of immigration. Exactly. You know, in about 10 years ago, 12 years ago, that's when we had a really big influx of Central American males. And I think, you know, people will begin to remember that when you really started yeah. to see a lot of Central Americans working in construction and landscaping. You know, that was the first wave that came pretty early after the trade agreement and after kind of their economy open. And now we're seeing kind of a second wave, you know, which is related to people having families now in the U.S., but it's also related to the longer term effects of the economic scenario that we put in place. And, and what has been the response uh, from the United States government with respect to this trade agreement and the adverse impact it's had on Central America? Crickets? Nothing? Well, it's interesting because if you look at the U.S. government websites, they'll say that trade in Central America has gotten better, like they are exporting more to the United States, and that is true. They are exporting more to the United States, but they don't peel that onion back and look at, well, who's doing the exports? You know, who is benefiting? So you'll see aggregate figures out there saying, you know, trade has improved for Central America 225 percent or, or whatever with the U.S. I'm but making that up that But that has to figure. do with Dole and all, all these big companies, it, it like has, you said. It has to do with the big companies. We, we, we can, we're smarter than that in this. We're smarter than that in this country. Come on. 
it's like we're falling for it. We are falling for it. We are falling for it. And part of the problem is that at the same time as we did that, you know, U.S. assistance to the poor around the world, our international aid programs, have shrunk and shrunk and shrunk because of our budget deficit. Yeah. And that's the money that we would use to help these farmers in Central America. And right now, there is none of that money. Well, now it looks like we're going to talk about another government shutdown. I mean, it's like it's, it's on and on and on. Anyway. Yeah. And it, it, it's, it's important, though, I, the, and I'm so glad that you brought this to my attention, Ritu. It's so important to understand the story behind the story because there's always a, a, a backstory that most of us are not privy to. And who would think that the, this trade agreement would be have a lot to do with maybe the influx we're seeing of these kids? In addition to the fact, as you're saying, how many of the, I don't know if you may not have the statistic, but I'm wondering how many of the children who come are girls versus boys? Well, what they're finding is that the, the ratio has really shifted in the last few years. Normally, they're mostly boys, but now they're saying, you know, rates of 20, 30, 40, 50 percent girls. So it's not that, I can't say that girls are the majority of those coming, but the share of girls has really increased. Ritu Sharma, thank you so much. Executive Director of Women Thrive, thank you for bringing this to our thank attention. You. Your book is great. Tell me the name of your book again. Teach a Woman to Fish. Because <laughs> if you teach us to fish... We're going to bring it home. Oh, every day of the week. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Ritu. And stay with us. We discuss recent U.S. Supreme Court decisions involving race when D.C. Breakdown continues.